hey, that's great. I might be terrible, and you've already clapped, so we're good. Um, I'm super grateful to be here. Uh, I'm really grateful to Kevin for asking me and for uh, Jason for getting us all set up. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I'm really grateful that you guys are here. I think sometimes we forget because we're probably all pretty like-minded in that we're interested in feeling motivated and setting goals and uh, accomplishing things. We forget how rare it is to have people give up an hour of their time, two hours of their time on a weeknight to come and learn more about uh, self-development and goal setting and finances and all these great things. Uh, so it puts you in, I like to call it an elite category, maybe because we're here together and I want to be in an elite category, but us here together, um, it's a rare thing. And so hopefully internally you can pat yourselves on the back uh, for making the effort to be here and uh, to do something uh, to continue to learn and to continue to grow. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, on me just real quick. Um, I did end up changing the, my whole presentation this morning. I just didn't, wasn't in love with what I had together and um, I was on a jog this morning out in the desert and I just kind of had this feeling like I just needed to, to bag it and do something different. And this came to my mind and I feel really passionate about it and it's something I love. Uh, but I, uh, I'm a dentist. I uh, started uh, a dental practice in 2006, which was great times to start a business. 2007 and eight, not such great times to be starting a young business. Uh, but in dentistry, at the time, there was this kind of this goal that if you had the million dollar practice that you were kind of at the, the good level, that was the success. That, that quantified success for me and for most dentists at the time was to get the million dollar practice. And so being a young guy coming out of school, how do you find out how to be a million dollar practice? Well, you look at the other people that have million dollar practices and you try and copy their genius, do whatever they're doing. And so you figure if I can do everything that they're doing to the T, then I will also have million dollar practice or a successful practice or a successful business like they do. And so I dove in and you start really focusing on your goals and you're focusing on your overhead and you're focusing on your staff and all of these things. And you, you're just going and going and going. And I'm, I'm a goal setting guy. So it's, I'd have it on boards all over the office, million dollar, million dollar, million dollars. I wanted everybody to know the vision of what we were doing and where we were going. And you start to have to worry about more and more and more factors, right? Because if things aren't growing as fast as you want them to grow immediately, you start thinking, okay, well, what's, what's wrong? What, why, am, why aren't people following what I'm doing? Why aren't they doing what I'm asking? And so you find all these things to stress about. You have your customers and your goals and your systems, and you're doing all these things. And what I found was I wanted to be at a million dollar practice like in one year. You know, I wanted all this success right now because I was doing everything and I was focusing on everything I needed. When you start to focus on all of these things too much or you focus on a number too much and if it doesn't come as quick as you want it to come then you what happens is male pattern baldness no stress <laughs> stress right you get burnt out because you can only go so hard for so long and not get any result that you want before you start to wonder okay what's wrong with me what am I doing wrong how come I can't do it and I found myself in that position where uh, I just, I didn't feel like I was leading my team very well because I would have some that would come and some that would go and uh, I'd have, I'd ask them to do stuff and I'd feel like I'd have to ask again the next month and I thought if I was a good leader, they would just pick it up the first time and run with it, right? Because that's how parenting works, right? You tell your kids once and they just do it right every time after. Uh, so I, I don't know if it was just bad expectations or what, but I found myself just completely burnt out and I was only a couple of years into owning a dental practice, uh, far too young to be that guy. And uh, so I called my dad and uh, my dad uh, is an orthopedic surgeon and he had uh, owned his own business and his own practice. So I knew he'd probably been through some of the things that I had been through. And I asked him, what do I do? I'm, I'm miserable. Like it's not growing how it should grow. I'm, I put all this effort into my the education, into honing my skills. And I think I'm talented and I think I'm a good guy. Like everything should be working and it's not. And he said, you know, do you remember when you were a kid and we would go on trips and go do humanitarian trips. Do you remember going with me and we would go, me and mom would go work in the hospital and you guys would hang out in the village wherever we were? And do you remember all of the times when we'd be gone for two weeks and we'd be in Brazil or in Africa? He's like, we would do humanitarian trips when I was feeling like that. When I was feeling burnt out, I realized that I was losing my focus. 
right? I wasn't focusing on what was actually important. I was focusing on the numbers and the growth and the, all these other uh, measures. And I needed to take time about once a year to set it all aside and go do something I loved and do something that wasn't about me, something that was all about other people. And so my advice from my dad was go somewhere and serve other people. Forget all about these numbers and these things you're trying to do. Get out and do something else. And I took his advice, and which started about a decade, about 10 years ago, a decade of traveling to do humanitarian trips at least once a year. If I can do more, I do more. Uh, but it's been fantastic. And I take my kids with me uh, when we go, which has been really eye-opening for, for them, uh, which I love because now anytime they complain about not having something and say, remember that time in Haiti and that kid was digging through trash for food and he had no clothes? How about that kid? <laughs> and then they start, they're quiet because they remember, right? They remember seeing that vision, that looking out the window and being like, oh my gosh, what in the world is going on? Uh, so it, it's been wonderful. What's been the most surprising is even going into these trips uh, at the start, it was always like, how am I going to go and bless other people, right? How am I going to be a blessing to them? And I found that it's completely the opposite. You get down there and they're blessing me way more than I could ever bless them. I'm learning so much more than the service of fixing their teeth. And I've been really surprised at the leadership lessons, the life lessons that I've learned from very unexpected sources as I've done these, these trips. And I wanted to share five of them with you. Uh, they're not all the tips on leadership that there are in the world, but they're five that, that have been impactful for me. Uh, and most of them are all stories from my trip. So my wife was like, don't make it like when people come back from a trip and show their slides for like an hour and bore everybody. I promise it's not. There are pictures from some, but each one has a really important story. Uh, so the first trip we did, my wife and I actually went to South Africa. And uh, I had been there as a kid. My, we lived there for two months while my parents worked in a hospital. And my younger brother and I got to go and pretty much play with the village kids all day. And we would cut down bamboo and um, try and attack those giant like termite hills you see in the, in the pictures, right? And try and find the queen termite. That was our day. It was glorious. So we went to uh, South Africa, my wife and I. And on the plane, uh, we're sitting next to a guy from Ireland. And this guy is like Irish, Irish. Like he's got the red hair and the red beard. Uh, he's like 50% leprechaun. He's just too tall, but he's, he looks like he's, uh, he's just Irish. You would have guessed, except he had an I Love New York t-shirt on, which was really cool. So I ask him where he's from. And uh, he says like, I'm bad with accents, but I'm gonna throw it out there, just lay it on the line. Uh, but he goes, I'm from Ireland. And I'm like, oh, really? That's cool. I love, I love Irish music. Uh, I've never been there. And he's like, well, I'm from Ulster. I'm like, oh, Ulster. I, I kind of know where that is. He's like, ah, but do you know the story of Ulster? And I said, no, I really don't. And we've got 14 hours on this plane. So I'm thinking I'm going to hear the story of Ulster. He's like, do you know about the red hand of Ulster? No, tell me about the hand. So in Ulster, which is a, no a northern part of Ireland, uh, this is their flag. And he's going to tell me why there's a red hand on the flag of Ulster. And if you, this is their official seal. So we've got the hand, some wavy water. This is a crown with the boat. Here's the story. I think the story is absolutely fascinating. So about 3,000 years ago, there are uh, some clans that are in Scotland. And these are the guys that are going to go over and conquer the native tribes in Ireland to become the kings of Ireland. And there's two major clans, and each one has a guy, a leader, who is claiming the right to be the king of this new island where they're headed. And they can't figure out how they're going to settle the, 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 the dispute. They don't want to fight clan against clan. So they come up with this challenge. They're going to get their best rowers in their fastest boat, each guy, and they're going to sail across the channel. And the first of these two leaders that can lay hands on the island of Ireland will become the king when they all get there. And so they hop in their boats and they start rowing and they're rowing and they're rowing. Now the one guy, uh, his name is Herman O'Neill. Okay, Herman O'Neill. And so they're rowing and he's on his boat and it's just neck and neck and they're going over these choppy waters and uh, they can see the land getting closer and closer. And it gets to a point where Herman looks up and he realizes no matter how hard they paddle, he's not gonna get there before the other guy. He's going to lose by about 30 feet. I mean, it's just close, but it's not going to happen. And so in a moment of 
brilliance or lunacy, I'm not sure, he takes a sword and he cuts off his left hand and he throws it onto the shore, being the first one to lay a hand on the island of Ireland. And the other boat either is scared of this guy because he's crazy or they obey the rules of the game. And they're like, yeah, he found the loophole. I guess he wins. And uh, so to this day, on buildings in Ulster, you'll see the depiction. There's the red hand of Ulster. Here's Harriman with a, a happy wave of his uh, victory. Now, here's the thing. The, uh, I think there's another one. Oh, he made it in Ripley's Believe It or Not, the story. So here's the thing, though. The O'Neills did become the kings of Ireland, and they ruled the northern Ireland, the island, sorry, the northern part of Ireland. They ruled it for 600 years. Their family held it for 600 years from one crazy, totally committed decision. Now, that's extreme, right? I mean, that's extreme. But here would be the life lesson that I learned, okay? A, find something that you're passionate about, something that excites you, something that you love, and then commit to it, right? Go, go all in 100% so that if you look up and maybe somebody's going to beat you to the goal, would you kick in an extra effort to make it happen for you? You know, do you, if an obstacle comes up, do you get discouraged and say, you know, you know what, the waves are a little choppy. I don't think we should even really cross the channel. Or do you get your team together and do you go full bore across the channel and do whatever you've got to do to be committed 100%? Now, here's the what the, my Irish seat companion told me, but he's like, people don't know much of the rest of the story. I didn't know the first story, but there's a rest of the story that I'd never heard before. Later on, this is maybe the le lesson number one subcategory something. Later on, about 20 years later, Harriman's in battle. He's fighting against two guys from another clan and he gets killed. Why? Can't properly hold the shield, right? So, it kind of undermines my whole point. But here's what I would say, because it's important to mention it. When we're going for what we're going for, right? Let's not shoot ourselves in the foot. Let's not make decisions and burn bridges that we can't go back over, that we can't cross. There's a time to burn a bridge. There's a time to cut off your hand. Uh, but it's not worth the future, right? It's not worth selling out a whole future for something that's going to happen uh, for a couple of years. It's not worth being away from home and leaving your kids there by themselves to go do something and later on, maybe you're successful, but your kids don't know you or they don't want to be around you because you weren't there for them, okay? So when you, we stay committed and we stay passionate, we have to do it with perspective. And if we don't do it with perspective, it can get really wonky really fast because we'll do things and we'll um, put ourselves in situations where we're neglecting one thing, but we're telling ourselves that we're doing this out of passion for the goal, right? Passion for the goal. And uh, that's what was happening to me, I think, in practice a lot is I was so focused on the million dollars that I was kind of forgetting about my people and forgetting about taking just really good care uh, of people. So that's lesson number one. Now, another one of our trips uh, was to Zimbabwe. And uh, Zimbabwe, uh, incredibly poor. They've been through horrible things in the last 15, 20 years. So here's what happened. So at one point, Zimbabwe was like the breadbasket of the southern part of Africa. They had the best farms, the best fields, uh, gold mines. They had, they had everything. They had uh, Victoria Falls, a uh, huge tourist. I mean, it, was, it was just a jewel of that part. Well, they get a new, uh, new president, President Mugabe, and he comes to power and he decides that he's not happy with all the European farmers that are in Zimbabwe that have been there for a couple hundred years uh, who have all the farms. So he decides that he's going to uh, take all of them. The farms are now all belong to the government. You have no farm and it doesn't matter if you've been here for eight generations. It's done. Uh, and then he took all of these farms and all of their big villas on the farms, and he gave them to all of his political friends as uh, vacation homes, you know, second houses. Uh, he's doing all this great stuff for his buddies. There's just one problem with that. His buddies don't, they don't farm, right? They don't keep crops growing. They just let it die. And so in a short space of time, what was tons of food, plentiful um, resources, shrinks to nothing. No food. Uh, hyperinflation sets in, the money's worth nothing. That's when we arrive, is about then. And we're driving in, into Zimbabwe from Botswana, and there's people just that would walk miles into Botswana where there's food, carry it on their head, walk miles back home just so they, uh, they could eat. Uh, the money became worthless. Where's my, where my, 
Well, we'll get to that one in a second. I'll show that one in a second. Um, so it's just in a, it's in a bad state. Now, the good thing is there's some really cool, fun stuff you can do right in Zimbabwe, right by the falls. And one of them is whitewater rafting. And I like whitewater rafting a lot. Now, one of the best whitewater rafting rivers in the whole world is in Zimbabwe. It's called the Zambezi. And uh, whitewater rafting, they do the rapids are class one up to class five. Sometimes there's a six if it, that's death. But one to five is the ones that you can go on. Uh, class one is like those like rough parts of the Salt River, like when you're tubing, it gets like, ooh, that's a one, okay? And then a five is like waterfalls and rocks and you're bouncing off of stuff. So the Zambezi River, you can do a half day trip and you can hit 21 class three, four, and five rapids in about four hours, which is crazy. It's just adrenaline peak. So uh, we signed up to do the Zambezi River. Now there's some uh, definite preparation that you have to do to make sure that you don't end up in the water too long because it is Africa and anytime that there's still water, crocodiles, you have to worry about crocodiles. So they said, as long as you're in the rapids out of the boat, you're cool. But if you get to the still water, got to kind of be careful. Well, after every set of rapids, there's still water. So falling out of the boat in the rapids and then you're like, I got to get back in now. <laughs> I got to get back in now. And it's kind of, I don't know why they told us that, <laughs> but it's scary. So they get us in the water and there's, there's a prep, right? There's a prep time and they'll call out an instruction. If you've ever been whitewater rafting, they'll say like left side three and they want three good paddles from the left side, right side, the reverse two. They have, uh, so we're practicing this in the still water. Uh, we're getting it going. And he asks, who wants to be in the lead position? And I'm like, I do. I, will, I want that. Whatever it is, I'll take that. Uh, so I'm in one and my dad's next to me in the other one. And uh, so he's like, okay, lead position. Sometimes I'm going to call your name and everyone else is going to be doing nothing. And you have to either drag or paddle because when you get into the rapids, I mean, you're going at these giant boulders. If you hit it straight on, you're usually fine. Bounce right over. If you hit it off by a couple degrees, you flip, right? And so he's like, at the last minute, I might call your name. You drag or you paddle just to get us that one degree uh, right in. So that's great. Our, our guide's name was Costa. That's Costa right here. He's in the back watching everything. So every rapid, Costa had this great thing. He would say, okay, here comes the, the big rapids. He's not Jamaican, but he sounds Jamaican. Uh, here come the big rapids. You can go this way, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Every time. You can go down this way, 50-50. You could go this way, we swimming with the crocodiles. Okay, so we, got the, we had that option every time. Do you want to easy peasy? Well, we're not going to pick easy peasy lemon squeezy. I mean, that's just not what we're doing. Um, swim with the crocodiles didn't sound that great. So usually 50-50. That's where we're going. We're going 50-50. 50% chance you're in the water, 50% chance not in the water. Uh, so I'll show you. This is how it looks when everybody follows directions, okay? So this is me, and I'm in my lead position. I'm the only one paddling because we got in there and he said, Chris, paddle three times. Okay, doing my paddle. Now, it doesn't matter if it's in the water. Don't worry about that. <laughs> as long as I'm doing this. So, <laughs> uh, now here's the thing. Okay, before you get in the boat, before you've ever got the life jacket on, you watch the video, right? You watch the video of other groups. So in my mind, I know there are cameramen filming which means I got to look good when it comes time for the pictures. I, I got I to gotta look good. Uh, so here's when everybody's doing their thing. Here's how it, it goes. Oh, here we go, Jason. Okay, so he see, whoops. Okay, I'm going to go back one quick. If you'll notice, Costa turns us sideways. We go into the rapids sideways. Okay, now I'm in the front. I'm the leader. So part of my brain's like, I got to correct this. You know, I got to paddle us straight. Luckily, I didn't. Costa knows the river. Right? He knows the pitfalls. He knows that if he goes in sideways, we're going to hit this one spot. It's going to turn us perfectly to hit the big one, and we're going to stay upright. So here we go. So you notice, here we are. We're coming in sideways in the rapids. He tells us all to get down. We do. It turns us magically. We hit it dead on. Hit the second one. We made it. No crocodiles this time. Okay, that's how it's supposed to work. Okay. Let me tell you about this scenario going on right here. Okay, everyone's been told, get down. And <laughs> me knows that there's camera crew. 
So what am I, I want to be in the video. Ah! I'm ready to go. At this moment, Costa is yelling at me, Chris, drag. He wants me to put the paddle in and drag because why we're turning too far to the left. He wants me to drag us back to the right. Do I hear him? I can't remember if I heard him or not. I actually know I heard him. I did not respond because the video looks better if I'm full on into the rapid. Let's see how this goes. Okay, this is about a second later. Uh, who's this lady tumbling off? That's my mom. <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> Who is this worried lady? That's my wife. Uh, we, hit, uh, we hit a rock at just the wrong angle, flip it to the right, and uh, we, dump, we dump pretty good. Costa is under the water. He's down here somewhere. I've, I pretty much sabotaged the whole ride, right? Because I wanted the picture. I wanted the video. Let's watch it in real time. From a, this is from the opposite shore. Here we go. That's me. Here we go. Oh, cameras. Yeah! Oh. 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 Now you're going to see a head pop out and then get shot down river into the calm water. Where is she? Yep, that's my wife. She ended up uh, like 300 yards down river from us just paddling in the calm water <laughs> and uh, while we're trying to rewrite uh, write the boat. Yeah, back up. Okay, so What's the lesson? There's lots of lessons, right? There's lots of don't do this ever again lessons from this. Here's what uh, one of the takeaways that, that I get. Pride is a terrible master, right? Wanting to be the one that has the cool picture and to be the leader and be everything to the point where I couldn't listen to instructions and I sold out my whole team because I wanted a good picture, I wanted a good video. That's a terrible way to go about uh, life. I realize that leading a team means being part of a team. It's not get out in front and do your thing and then just have them tail along behind you following what you do. When you're leading a team, you're in the team, you're one with the team, you're part of the team, right? That's what breeds a team that works hard for you. Uh, that's what breeds a team that's successful. It's not with a guy out front and we just follow along. It's they can look side to their shoulder and you're right there next to them, right? You're in it with them uh, doing what they've been asked to do. Now, funny story from this, Costa was telling us about another group of leaders. So the day before we had got there, he had a group of Japanese tourists that had come and they had never been on a river ever. And they're down there on this really hard river. They got their life jackets. He's got four of them. And then he's got these two like New Zealand guys, like, you know, like New Zealand, the cool guys, right? Like the cool outdoor, we do everything. And they're all, they got their own life jackets and their cool helmets. And so the Japanese guys are asking Costa, like, what do we do? What do we do? And they're asking him over and over. And he's trying to teach me. He's like, you know what? Watch those two guys in front. Whatever they do, just, just follow those guys. They know what's going on. So they're getting in there. They're hitting these rapids. They're going, they're going. Well, they hit a rock funny. It folds and the New Zealand guys get launched. They're both out of the boat. He's like, two seconds later, all the Japanese guys look at each other and they just jump out of the boat. <laughs> they're just like, Whoa! they just went because they were following the leader and the leader got kicked. So uh, he's like, all of a sudden, like, I have a boat not flipped over and everybody's in the water and I'm saying to chase them all, track them all down. Uh, so that's Costa. All right. Uh, great guy. Super great guy. Now back to uh, Zimbabwe. So like I said, at this time they're in complete, I mean, it's, it's the, uh, the great depression in Zimbabwe. There's no food, there's no money. Uh, hyperinflation I was telling you guys about. That's a $100 trillion bill. Uh, this was mine. I, I'm not as rich. I had, mine was $100 billion. Yeah, $100 billion bill. Now, to give you perspective on how much this was worth when I was there, I went to a convenience store, almost completely empty. There's no food there because there's no food in the country, but they have Coca-Cola. I bought a Coca-Cola with a $5 bill American. This was my change. $100 billion in Zimbabwe. Right, so this is probably worth, at that time, a couple of bucks, right? Maybe three bucks. People would take, you'd see them with sacks of cash and they would come out and they, and they were just buying bread. I mean, little things. Uh, so the money was worthless. Uh, everybody's poor, uh, miserable, there's no food. I mean, it's just, it's just bad. The fact that he had a job at all made him wealthy, uh, no matter what it paid. If you had any kind of an income or food in your home, you were doing really well. Well, we are uh, headed back. We've, uh, we've finished the river thing. We you climb out. We all hop in the back of this truck. 
and you drive back to the main city, which is Victoria, Victoria Falls. To get to Victoria Falls, you drive that truck through the village where these guys all live. All the guides live in this little village. And you're driving through the village, and there's people walking. Um, and every time the truck would pass somebody walking down the street, Costa would be like, hey, thumbs up. And he would lock eyes on him, and he would not take his gaze off of him until they looked up and gave him a thumbs up, saying, are you good? You're good. Yep, I'm good. He would, not, he would not allow them. He would yell at them until they picked up their head, looked at him, and said, yeah. Like he's connecting with everybody we pass. I don't know if they're family, friends, strangers, whatever. We get a little bit farther, and we pass the guys, like most of them uh, at this time, most everybody we saw kind of walks with the head down. Everybody's kind of in despair. We pass one guy, hey! Guy doesn't even look up. Just keeps kind of walking. Hey, hey! And he's giving the thumbs up. Nothing. Costa yells to the driver to stop the car, the truck, right, with all of us tourists in there. So they stop the truck. He gets out. He goes to the guy, picks his head up. Hey, hey. And they talk, and I have no idea what they're saying. But they finish with this. Yeah? And the guy's like, yeah. Right? Costa saw a problem. He wasn't going to let somebody in his sphere be down, right? He wasn't going to pass on by without knowing, are you okay? I'm okay. You're good? I'm good, right? Everything around us stinks right now. But I need to know that I, I see you, you see me, and we're, we're okay, that you're good. Their word in Africa, you may have heard this, the, the word in a lot of African dialects, the way they say hello or good morning, is saubona. Saubona means I see you, right? That's how it translates. So they don't just say, hey, what's up, you know, and then go on their way. They're like, I see you, right? That's their hello, I see you. And the response uh, that they give, which I don't remember the word for, is basically, I've been seen, I see you. Right? They're connecting every time they say hello to someone. They're, they're connecting with them. They're connecting with them. And you think about our society. I mean, we, how many people do we cross? Sometimes even people we know. And it's like a, across the, the hall, like, hey, you know, head nods all we can offer is, or uh, what's up. You know, really quick, but we're, not, we're already on thinking about what we're doing. We're not stopping at all to think, like, I hope they're doing okay. You know, I remember they were struggling with this. I hope they're doing okay. It's, we've got our own things that we're doing, our own life, and we're just kind of trekking along. And sometimes we forget that we're part of a, a big family, right? A really big family. And we need to make sure that each other are okay. And that's uh, the lesson that you learn from Costa. I like to say your value as a human being is not measured by what you have, but what you give. Like how much of yourself do you give? Not, not money, not whatever. How much of yourself, your time, your talents, your caring, right? How much are you gonna give to somebody else? Because um, the more you give, the more you grow. And I like to think of it, like a scale, and I understand this is a totally imperfect analogy, but if everything's a scale, the more that you're giving to everybody else, the more of yourself that you're giving away, right? You're, if you're giving them everything you can, and you're sitting in this pan, what happens to you? Right? It raises you up, right? You're moving up. The more that you give, and the, more, the faster that you do it, the more that you go up, right? And we are in a, a get what you can type of world, right? We're in a get yours, get yours, get yours. Well, I promise you, that it's a backwards way of thinking, right? It's a, it's a way to get a short-term success and a short-term hit of the, the success uh, neurotransmitters. We feel good, but it's really fleeting, okay? What's lasting is what are you building around you? If you lift everybody up around you, it is impossible for you to stay down, right? If everybody around you is coming up, you're coming up. Uh, so think of it like that. Instead of waking up and thinking, what can I get today? What can I get done today? Who could I help today? Right? Who could I just give a phone call to and say, how you doing? Who could I send a message to through social media? Anything, a, a little thing. I don't think we realize how special it is if someone were to send us a message uh, through Instagram or Facebook or whatever that just said, hey, I was thinking about you today. You're awesome, right? That's so uncommon in the world today. So uncommon that we just get an unsolicited compliment from somebody that we know, right? It's those uncommon things that make people great people, right? Doing the little uncommon things that have been lost, but that connect you with other people. So as you go about, so starting tomorrow, wake up and think, who can I help? Who can I compliment? Who can I just give an uplifting word to? Uh, who's on my team that I can make sure that I support them, right? And not so much, how can they support me? Uh, Zig Ziglar, I love this, one of my favorite quotes ever. You can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people accomplish what they want in life. Right? If you can help enough people around you to accomplish their goals, 
you will have all the goals that you want. You'll accomplish your goals by focusing on helping other people to, to get those. And I think that's probably at the heart of what this company does. I mean, that's, that's what you do. It's, it's finding good information that uplifts everybody around you, right? And it's building teams where you support each other and you help each other. And you realize that a rising tide raises all ships, right? When everybody's doing better together, individually, everybody's doing uh, better. So we'll move from that. I want to go to uh, Costa Rica. Now, Costa Rica, uh, third world, I don't know. A lot of Americans living down there. Probably not third world. Second world. Parts of it, first world. Uh, but there's a great lesson in Costa Rica. So uh, we went down there to go um, donate money to an orphanage. And we got down there. And we're in, at the airport. We go over to the rental car place. And we're renting the car. And uh, I speak Spanish, so I'm thinking I'm cool because I'm chatting with him and the guy asks like now you want for five dollars more you want the GPS I'm a guy do I want the GPS no I can read a map you know I like offended that he's offering me the GPS I don't want the GPS I got this luckily my wife we, let's take the GPS we'll do the GPS okay we get the GPS I'm so skeptical of Central America GPS, right? It's just not, it's not it's, it could not be better than my map reading skills. No way. So if you've ever been on roads in other countries, right? Like it's, it's like scooters everywhere, just doing whatever, anywhere from one to 19 people on a scooter and they're just cruising along and you're just there. So we're headed to our destination. And uh, I mean, I know where I'm going, I've got a map. And you're driving and I'll call her Siri, but I don't know what this GPS version of Siri was. She'd say, in 100 feet, turn left. And we're driving and I see the suspected turn 100 feet to the left. And it's like an alleyway. And I'm like, that is not the right way. She's ridiculous. And so we drive right past it because I'm sure that from what I've read of the map, there's a good highway coming up that we're gonna turn on and it's gonna be smooth sailing. If you ever missed a turn with Siri, here's what she says so politely, recalculating route. It's a nice way of saying, you're an idiot. You screwed up. <laughs> Let me fix this for you real quick. So recalculating route, ah, fine. So then she comes up with a different, rate, a different route, which is either turn around or you can go farther. This happens probably three or four times where it's like, eh, eh, that's not the right way. And then I have to backtrack and I look stupid. Uh, it just keeps happening. We did make it to our destination. Guess what? When I started listening to Siri more often. But there's a really important lesson. And this is why I think Siri or whatever she is, is brilliant. Okay. When you think about life goals, right? We have life goals, things that we're trying to achieve and accomplish that we've, we've planned on, uh, written them down, hopefully. Uh, we know what we're shooting for. And when you set the goal every time, right? Like it just, all the steps you planned on happening just happen just the way you hoped, right? All the way there. Like it's just a yellow brick road onto the goal. It, every time, no, never happens. In the history, it's never happened to anybody. There's always the curve. There's always the turn you didn't expect to take. There was the, the moped that broke down in the road in front of you that you had to get out. There's something, there's always something. And a lot of people, when they hit the something, they're like, oh, Ah, it didn't work. And they abandon the goal. Right? I better change goals because this is a sign. This is a sign that I'm not supposed to be on this path because this obstacles keep coming up. When really what they should be doing is what? Recalculating route, right? You don't change the goal, right? You keep the goal. You're still trying to get to the same place, right? But you recalculate the route. You say, okay, here's what I plan on happening. Here's the map I made. That didn't work out. Okay, what's the new map? Do I need to go learn something different? Do I need to try a different skill? Do I need to get advice from somebody? Uh, do I just need to persist on and get over this hump of what I'm doing? Can I recalculate my route without giving up my goal? And so that's, the, that's what we, we try and do. We don't abandon the goal. It's not a bad goal. If you're passionate about it and you love it, it's not a bad goal and you'll never be wrong for going for it. But you, we let ourselves down, I think, a little bit too often because we get, we get discouraged. We don't recalculate and say, you know what? That didn't work. Learn from it. Let's keep moving and try something uh, different, but let's keep going for the goal. Now, this is the flag of uh, Botswana. Uh, this is the flag of Botswana. So uh, we were down there 
a couple years ago, and uh, Botswana is a cool place. It's a really cool place. It actually shares a border with Zimbabwe. So they actually share that, uh, that river, the Zambezi River where we whitewater raft. That's the border between Botswana and Zimbabwe. And there's this bridge. This is the bridge that goes over Big Falls. And this bridge is great. It's the second highest bungee jump in the world is this bridge. Well, when in Botswana, you know the saying, when in Botswana, be Botswana, I don't know. If you're there, we didn't plan on it, but if you're there, you gotta, you gotta jump, right? You gotta do the bungee jump. And so we did. Now, I'll paint the picture of this bungee jump, okay? Uh, probably really like OSHA, whatever people are in charge of safety, I'm sure have cleared this thing. But you walk out onto the bridge and there's like this little wooden hut, <laughs> shack thing. And there's, uh, and, and then like a plank, like, like we're pirates, Botswana pirates, and there's a plank. And uh, you see people and they're there with a the harness and you look at this bungee cord and it's a fat bungee cord and it is frayed like you've never seen anything frayed. It's like a, it's like a cat, like it's a fur ball all the way down. And so you're looking at it and you're like, wow, that doesn't seem that safe, right? But we paid, so we better just do this. Um, so we got, we had major reservations, my wife and I, like just looked at the thing like our kids are back home. We don't have a will, <laughs> like this is gonna be horrible. And we're, we weren't tandem jumping, so only possibly one of us would perish and the other could, the legacy would live on, <laughs> right? So, uh, so we get to the bridge and um, I'm still in um, like, look good for the pictures mode at, at this stage of the game. So it's my first time ever bungee jumping. So I'm planning it, I'm like, it's gonna be the most beautiful swan dive Botswana has ever seen, like glorious, right? It's gonna be so good. And uh, so we get there, I, I'm up there and I'm on the, the plank and they walk out there with you and they've got their hand on there and they're gonna count down for you, but whether you jump or not, they're pushing you, like you're going whether you want to. So you're out there and like you're looking down and I remember just being really scared, not for the jump, but scared that I was gonna like take a step off the plank and fall sideways and it would be just terrible. So I am so focused on my swan dive because I know we're getting the pictures in the video. I'm paying for them because I'm going to look really good and everybody back home is going to be so impressed. I'm going to be viral on Instagram, whatever it is. I don't know. So we get out to the plank. They count down. I jump and it is magnificent. Just, it's so good. It's blurry, but it's so good. And uh, I got two thirds of the way down and had this shocking realization that I had not experienced anything in the first two thirds. I was so dang focused on holding my arms perfectly in a swan dive and not like, oh. I didn't even, I missed the whole view. I missed the whole experience. I missed everything. I remember like in slow-mo having this thought like, I'm missing this because I'm so worried about how I look coming down uh, off this bungee jump. And that's, that's really important. I didn't realize it till later. When I was trying to build my business and trying to grow it, I was so worried about it looking like a cosmetic dental practice that's a million dollar. I, I, I was so worried about, uh, I mean, the, the color of the scrubs that the girls were, everything had to be this like perfect picture in my mind of what this business had to look like to achieve what we wanted to achieve. I forgot to enjoy building a business. To this day, one of the greatest things, greatest joys of my life has been building my business. So much fun. It's hard. It's hard, right? It's hard and there's times when you just, you kind of just want to give up because it's not working out. But if we do that too much, if we're so focused on it, we forget that it's a ride. It's a really fun ride. Life in general is a really awesome, fun ride. And we spend way too much of it worrying about how it looks. How does this look to everybody? How does this business look? How does my life look to other people that we forget to just step back and just enjoy it, right? I worry so much about my kids behaving perfectly when we're in public and this and that, that I forget to just enjoy my kids, right? Like just let them be kids and have fun because I'm going to remember them spilling water at Chili's more than I'm going to remember them sitting there perfectly doing whatever they think. Like I don't want boring kids. I want fun kids. But the pressure is to have one way. 
don't live life in a way that we're so worried. Do, do life your way. I'll tell you about the, the greatest the greatest thing I ever did for my business, right, was when I made the mental change from trying to be like the other practices that I looked up to and just deciding to create a business around what I loved. And we did a big rebranding of my whole office. We changed the name. We changed everything. Um, I'm into, I love inspirational quotes and motivational speaking, all that. So we changed the name to Inspire Dental. Why? Because I like to inspire people and I like to feel inspired. Um, we got rid of all the artwork of dental type things and we've got positive quotes. Uh, we put up uh, my photography everywhere. So it's, it's, it's about me, right? I stopped caring about trying to look like whoever's. And I said, you know what? I've assembled a group of people that like working with me. I've assembled a group of people who are, we're all very similar and like-minded. And we tend to attract patients that are also very similar and really cool and laid back. And they want to see a unique dental practice. Like they want to connect with us my team and we want to connect with them and I don't want anyone walking in the doors and being like hey this looks like one of those million dollar dental practices doesn't it I don't want that I want people to come away and feel inspired and we we put little positive quotes in their goodie bags when they go we put books little motivational books in their goodie. We, we do anything we can to inspire and to just live us like live who we are and create a brand around who who we are and whether we like it or not we're all creating a brand right Every single one of us has a personal brand. People know what they can expect of us. Uh, people know how to kind of, they'll try and kind of pigeonhole you in certain, certain spots. Um, but we're a brand. The words that we say, the way that we dress, everything we do is, is a brand. And so we got to ask ourselves, okay, what, what's the brand that I'm putting out there? Is the brand really me? Or is it an image that I want people to think of me? The closer that the brand that's the real you gets to the one that people see is the happier that you are and the more successful you are. Right? If your personal brand matches up with what people um, expect of you and are, what they're seeing, then you achieve a different level. Right? You start to see success where you didn't see it because everything's in line. Anyone play piano? I play piano. Right? There, you, know, you can play a note and it can be, you can play a chord that's in harmony, right? And it sounds great. But an A chord can't be a C chord, right? You can't all of a sudden move a finger over and like, oh, I'll just add this note because a lot of people like that note and then play it and have it sound any good, right? It, there's a, um, like a dissonance, right? There's like a, something doesn't fit, right? And that's, that's our, our lives, right? Is that our brand has to match what we want for our life and then the, what we put out there has to be us. The second that we changed and started focusing on that, just doing us, like let's just be us as a dental practice, all of these things, I didn't, I stopped worrying about systems. I stopped worrying about a lot of this stuff. We, we blew by million dollars so fast. I didn't even notice that it, because I wasn't focused on it. I didn't really care. And it was all of a sudden one day we were talking to the accountant. He's like, Hey, you guys did this, this, this much. And I was like, Holy cow. I didn't have my balloons ready for our million dollar day. Like I thought it was going to be this big party when we hit a million dollars and we blew by it so fast. It is a hundred percent because we changed the focus. Right? We change the focus to, to make it about us and to give and give. And so I, I encourage everyone on my staff, sh share stories about raising kids. I think some of the most special moments we've had in our office is when my hygienists are sharing struggles they're having with their kids. And there's a mom in the chair that's having a similar struggle. And they just bond and they give each other ideas and they go out to lunch afterwards. And they're just, it's, it's just this magical, beautiful thing uh, that you just wouldn't expect. And it's because we're all trying to connect and we all want to be our best. And so when we find other people that are willing to share and help us, um, it's really uh, pretty neat and pretty magical. Uh, so I achieved the number when we stopped focusing on the number, if that makes any sense. Um, now I've got another story before you go, but when you guys leave, um, I write little books. I brought one for all of you guys. If you are, oh, you haven't even read it yet. It is my, no, excuse me. Um, it is inspiring. Uh, this one's called Do Good. Actually, when we go on our humanitarian trips, this is what I give to everybody that goes with us. Uh, if you are watching from not here, uh, if you go to my website, which is just chrisheap.com, you can download them all for free. I've got, I think there's five books on there. They're all little mini books. You can read them in like 10 minutes, which I love because I think a lot of self-help and motivational books are like three really good chapters and then just filler like you wouldn't believe and it just gets really dull and boring. So I figured cut all that stuff out and let's just have like a couple really good chapters. All right. So make sure you get one if you want one. Okay. This one's not abroad. This is America, right? We know this flag. Um, so uh, I was, everyone remember this moment? 
okay? So we all remember where we were 9-11, right? I was in dental school. Uh, I was in the library studying, so I had no clue anything had happened and came into the, the dental school and everybody was packed into the, the break room watching TV and, uh, and we're just seeing it unfold, right? And everybody remembers where they were. I'd like to think this is the moment, and this is a total politics aside, I think this is the moment when George Bush became president, like president, president, okay? So he's at ground zero. These guys have been working for days, right? No sleep or little sleep. And uh, he's there and in an unscripted moment, grabs the bullhorn and he climbs up on the, the wreckage, right? And basically says, we're not gonna let this happen. It, in all, in, for all intents and purposes, it says you can't bully us, we're gonna make sure that whoever's responsible for this, we're gonna take, take care of them, right? So that's in September. Now, at September in America is baseball playoff season, right? And so a lot of people weren't sure, were we still going to have baseball? Like, is there still going to be the playoffs? Should we just cancel the season? What do we, what do, we do? Um, George Bush got on the uh, phone with uh, Commissioner of Baseball. They talked through it. They said, it needs to go on. Baseball is America. Uh, it's our pastime. Uh, so they continued with the playoffs. And this is the year when the Diamondbacks went to the World Series, right? And uh, so the first two games, we had the better record. The first two games were played in Phoenix, uh, which was great. Now, game three of the World Series, we were playing the Yankees, right? So it's going to be in New York. And there's huge concern because I think if there's going to be another attack, that would be prime, prime viewage, prime, I mean, the most bang for their buck uh, would be to uh, attack. Well, a couple hours before the umpires, there's a video, great video you can watch. A couple hours before they get phone call, the president's going to come to the game and he wants to throw out the first pitch. Okay. And uh, they've got... Great video of the, you can, uh, on YouTube, you can watch it. He comes in, he says, I promised I'd never throw out a pitch in the World Series unless it was my Astros, but I'm gonna make an exception. And he's telling jokes. And um, so he's in there and he realizes like, you know, I gotta, I gotta throw, I gotta get loosened up. He has to wear full uh, body armor. So under his jacket, he's got full body armor and he's gotta throw out this pitch. Now, I don't, I don't get too scared about too many things, but throwing out a first pitch of the game would terrify me because if you blow that pitch, like, oh, it's everywhere. It's going to be on the news. Like, and that's, not, that's a long way to throw a perfect strike. So in Yankee Stadium, they've got um, like little hitting batting cages. And so he's down there and he's warming up his arm and he's throwing. And Derek Jeter passes by and uh, he's the captain of the Yankees. And uh, so they're talking. And uh, so Jeter's like, so you thinking you're gonna throw from the mound or like somewhere halfway. And uh, President Bush is like, well, I think I'm gonna just throw from the front of the mound. And Derek Jeter's like, no, they'll boo you. You have to throw, you gotta throw from the mound. I mean, you're the president, you gotta throw from the mound. And he's like, oh, okay, I'll throw from the mound. So he's warming up the arm and he's about to go out and Jeter's like, oh yeah, one more thing. Don't bounce the pitch. Do not have it hit in front and have to bounce into the guy's glove. Like they will boo you, it'll be all over. No pressure, don't bounce the pitch. So uh, he goes out there, right? And I don't know how many of you remember this moment, but he gives a thumbs up to everybody and the place just is going nuts and uh, winds up and he's pretty athletic. We didn't really know this, but he's, he's a pretty athletic guy. And he throws a pitch, perfect strike. Little bit of an arc. Perfect strike, right? Which is pretty rare. If you ever watch people throwing out the pitch, it's usually horrible. Throws this perfect strike. Now, I try and imagine the weight on his shoulders at that moment. I mean, that is enough. That would, that would, I would buckle. <laughs> I think I would just, I would just, I couldn't do that. Um, but the important message I think came from Derek Jeter, right? You're here, you're the leader. Don't bounce the pitch, right? Don't give it a half effort. Don't, don't throw it not hard enough. If you're here, see it through, right? Make it happen. Don't bounce the pitch. Give everything you have, you can. Warm up, practice, whatever you do, but hit the target. And I use that. I actually have that sign above my um, desk in my, my office. It just says, don't bounce the pitch, right? If I'm going to go into my day, don't give it a half effort, right? Don't give half conversations to my, my team. Don't give half to my patients, right? Don't bounce the pitch. Give it everything I have. If I've got a goal, don't just throw a goal out there and then for years and years be like, oh yeah, I kind of want to accomplish that. Like that's bouncing the pitch. Go for it, right? And give everything you've got because not only are there people depending on us, but more than anything, we depend upon us, right? When we accomplish something, how good does that feel, right? When you hit a goal, 
that feels so good. No matter how big or small it is, it feels so good to hit a goal. And so our own ego is depending on us to give it everything we've got so that if something doesn't go right, we know it wasn't because we didn't try hard enough or because we gave up too early, right? So when we're going to go in, go in all the way. Don't, don't bounce the pitch. Don't give it a half effort because we got one shot, right, at life in general. And we're going to get a lot of chances to, to pitch. You know, a lot of balls we're going to throw. We're gonna, every day, whether it's with our family or whether it's in business or wherever it is, right, we've got opportunities where it might be stressful uh, or might be hard, but we're going to give it everything we got because it's on us, right? It's on us to take care of people around us, right? It's on us to take care of our community and our families. Uh, but really importantly, we've got to take care of ourselves, right? We have to keep learning and progressing so that when the time comes, we can perform under pressure and do great things. Um, I will tell you that there are life lessons everywhere. Everything in our whole day is an analogy. It's everything around us is something we can learn. And that'd be my, my biggest message I try and tell people is just to keep your eyes open and know that the best learning moments are in the fail moments, right? And it's okay to fail, but just fail forward, right? Fail and learn and move on and go forward. And I promise that as we do that, and as we look for opportunities to learn from people around us, and as we take care of people around us, one day you'll look up and realize, you know what? I accomplished half my goals that I thought would take a lot longer, and I wasn't even focused on them. I was just focusing on being uh, my best and helping the people around me be their best. And I'm super grateful for you guys having me tonight. Thanks so much for being amazing. <laughs> And I'll see you guys next time. Too much. Too much. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so, so much. That was wonderful. And yes, absolutely. Everybody needs to grab one of Chris's books. He also has a personal blog online, Successify. Highly recommend um, you follow him on Instagram, social media. We've been talking a lot about that lately as well. Um, but I had a chance to go on his, uh, his personal blog, and it's incredible. So much information on there. And what a great night, third world um, lessons in leadership. Great, great, great topic. Let's give him one more round of applause. Woo! Thank you to our online community as well. We miss you, we love having you. Um, what we're gonna do now, Kevin has actually allowed me to carry on the torch of yes. the drawing, which I don't know, I don't know if I can handle this pressure. Oh man, we'll see. Um, pardon? I gotta pick that one. Okay, no pressure at all, right? Um, don't bounce the pitch. <laughs> okay. You have to remember, I haven't been here like for live for like six, I know. Price. First price is, I don't even know the price. $50 gift certificate to Oregano. Woo! Oh. Oregano. Oh. Yeah! Okay, everybody on your feet! On your feet! On your feet! Man, it's, not, it's funny, nobody wanted to learn and get excited, but yeah, Bazookis. Oh my gosh, that is something that doesn't exist in Canada. Don't do it the mean way. I'm not. <laughs> okay, Oregano's $50 gift card. First number, two. Woo! Eight. Yes. Dr. Heap, what we do is we make everyone a winner. For, <laughs> yeah, I'm for, noticing the pattern. For five of the six numbers. <laughs> This is true. Two, eight, five. Yes. Okay, now it's gonna get tense. I'm shaking, I can't even handle this. Two. Oh man. Eight. Well, there, there should be 10. There should be nine people up. There's a zero through nine. Oh my gosh. Okay, two, eight, five, two, eight, nine. Winner! Winner, winner! Is there a second prize? What? He inspired me and caused me to have, you can sit down, Pastor. You've had your moment, sit. You've had your moment. He inspired me with all of the uh, frightening things. So what we're going to do, it won't probably happen till late September when it happens. No, no, a balloon ride for two. We're giving away, I was talking to someone earlier today about it, so we're giving away a balloon ride. Have you ever done it? No. 
Okay, you're, you're, you're not in the drawing. All right, but it's good to know you haven't done that. That's outstanding. Here we go, we're drawing for a balloon ride. No, no, I, I think you can handle it. Here you go. No pressure, right? No pressure. I love the idea of a balloon ride. <laughs> two, eight, five, two, eight. I don't know if I can handle this. This is a lot of pressure. Six. Oh my gosh, Dwight Lamb wins the balloon ride. Dwight Lamb wins. <laughs> hey everybody, thank you. I think this has been a great evening. One more round of applause for uh, Dr. Heap.